Well, good and gracious God, we thank you, first of all, for the sunshine of this day, Lord, as we come together to worship, uh, basking in the holiness of the sending of your Son. May our words today, Lord, my words, be of you. May it land fresh on people's hearts, Lord, and I pray, um, I pray, Lord, that uh, this message will help to transform our lives, that it is your words and not mine. Lord, help me say out of the way and let your word be heard in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, begin today with an illustration. Um, you know, some of you may have traditions that you go through when putting out <coughs> nativity sets. Um, <coughs> a lot of times, uh, that's something that children, for example, can remember all the rest of their lives. And there was a creative dad who decided he would try and build some excitement for Christmas while teaching his kids to keep Christmas focused on the Savior's birth. Sounds like a Good idea, right? So he carefully set out the nativity, the Mary, the Joseph, um, and the shepherds, the angels, the wise men. But instead of putting baby Jesus in the manger, he put a mystery note with a clue, with a clue as to where uh, these children could find the baby Jesus. So every day, these children would run downstairs to get their clue and search or baby Jesus. And every night, Dad would in turn create another clue and hide the main attraction of Christmas. So these children, get the picture here, they are searching daily for Jesus, and it leads us uh, to do some self-reflection, right? As to whether or not, I wonder, we're seeking Jesus in a very real and in a very spiritual way. My hope and prayer is that um, we'll take the time to consider whether we really seek to allow the Christ child, whose birth, of course, we just celebrated, into the deepest reaches of our heart. So you might be saying, well, how do we do this? You know, uh, and, and I would say to you, we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Um, we have examples in Scripture that the Lord in His wisdom provided for us. Everything that you need for your spiritual life is in this incredible book. But today, we see a couple of uh, little-known people that are mentioned who have a powerful testimony. And as I said, they don't get much press, but they do appear in the original Christmas story. These are people who searched for Jesus. And I talk about him today with the hope that each one of us will find Jesus in a new way um, and place him then in the proper place of priority that he takes precedence in our lives. Now, on the other hand, we could take a pass. We just concern ourselves with things like, uh, where can I find the best after Christmas deals? Okay, so I happened to go out yesterday morning to pick up a few things and made the mistake of going to Hobby Lobby. <laughs> I arrived a bit early. didn't know what time the uh, store opened. It turned out to be, I think it was about 8.40 a.m. The store opened at 9. So I decided to wait a few minutes. I had my computer and I needed to prepare for today. Probably shouldn't admit this, but as of yesterday morning, I had no sermon, we had no PowerPoint, and I had things to do. Well, within a couple of minutes, I noticed something. Cars started showing up in ever intense numbers, and I had parked, I always park my vehicle out away from others because I don't want them banging into it, scratching my doors, and all that kind of stuff, and pretty soon there were cars all around me, and these people got out of their cars, they proceeded to the doors to wait in line with intensity. They wanted to be the first in line to get in there for those after Christmas deals. I thought my, to myself something at that point. I was like, wow, you know, how I wish that people with the same intensity would line up to come into church. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? And, uh, so we have a, a, the first slide, I think it's rather a little bit more like what's on this sign. The, the fact that there's a highway to hell and only a stairway to heaven says a lot about anticipated traffic numbers, right? Unfortunately, I say I think that's a little more true. And I don't want to judge those people going into Hobby Lobby. Um, after all, I was one of them, right? But uh, um, I simply want to make us aware of the intensity of people as they were gathering yesterday like flies on a manure pile. Um, so, Simeon and Anna, well, 
they're two such people who searched not for the local Hobby Lobby. They were searching for the Messiah with confident faith. And this is what marked them, set them apart. Confident faith, eager expectation. Um, some like Elizabeth and John, you know, Mary and Joseph, they were surprised with the unexpected news that the Messiah would be born. There were others like Herod who searched with the intention of destroying Jesus. But for many today, you know, what I thought about is the closest they come to worship and seeking the Christ is when they drive by a house of worship, probably without even a thought of Jesus and the need for his presence in their lives or in in the world. We're not going to be, and this is what I came to the conviction of, we're not going to be one of those people. We're going to look at some of the detail in this gospel text in Luke and hopefully appreciate why the events described are so valuable, okay? Why they're so meaningful to our Lord's ongoing story. We're going to expand, in other words, our knowledge of the grand entry of our Lord into this world in order that we can appreciate it more and more and more, the magnificence of his plan for our safe passage all the way into eternity, the eternity of heaven. So let me turn our attention first to what actually did happen when Jesus was taken to the temple that day, because we don't understand what they were living through at that time. There were actually three things that happened there on that day, important things to the Jewish people. The first was the circumcision of Jesus. It occurred on the eighth day of a boy's life as prescribed all the way back in the law of Moses. Leviticus 12.3 says, and on the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. We've got to understand here, a person didn't become a Jew simply by being born into a Jewish family. That's not the way it happened. What happened was significant when they were circumcised. Then they could claim the Jewish faith for themselves. Now, at that same time, what was going on is the child's name was given at, normally at the circumcision. In this case, it says, and at at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel, before he was conceived in the womb. <clears throat> okay, that's Luke 2, 21. Now, this circumcision of Jesus, it signifies something very significant to Mary and Joseph. It is their obedience, uh, okay? They were serious about their faith, okay? They... Uh, they weren't. Uh, uh, they were. They were very religious Jews, so to speak. Which, in contrast, today, what I understand about Israel is most of Israel um, they're not practicing Jews this day, believe it or not. But it also demonstrates that Christ came into the world <clears throat> for the purpose of fulfilling the laws going all the way back to Moses. It says, but when the fullness of time had come, which we read in Galatians, God sent forth His Son born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive, this is incredible, adoption as sons. Um, The obedience of Jesus' parents qualified him to fulfill the promises that were pledged way back centuries earlier to Abraham. And notice it doesn't say to Abraham and to his offsprings. It says that, The promises would be filled to Abraham and his offspring, who is Christ. Now, there's a second thing that happened there and uh, that day, and and this event was noteworthy. It was the purification of Mary. Okay, That was critical back then. 33 days after the birth of a child, the mother would appear in the temple to present a sacrifice to make her ceremonially clean. The birth of a child to Jewish people was a reminder of a couple of things. Mortality and sinfulness. Mortality and sinfulness. Therefore, it was felt they needed to be purified, go through a time of purification. Um, and so that was happening that day also. And then um, the sacrifice, we're told, of two turtle do- doves shows Mary and Joseph were extremely poor, economically speaking. They had little means. They're not the kind of parents you would think would be the caretakers of a king. 
But now that purification rich, ritual had been completed. Mary is deemed clean, and she's able to participate in the third thing that happened that day, the presentation of the firstborn. Uh, the redemption of the firstborn, just described all the way back in Exodus 13.2, says, consecrate to me all the firstborn. This is God speaking, so we better listen up, right? Uh, Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine says God. And then it it goes on in uh, Exodus 13, 12, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord. So it included, you know, not only humans, but uh, animals as well. And it feels like my microphone's cutting in and out a little bit. I hope people are hearing me okay. But uh, that special sacrifice was required because the firstborn, if you recall your history, and the, it, folks, it's so important for us to know the history, to make these connections. Um, the firstborn, remember, was spared by God at the Exodus. The firstborn belonged to God. It had to be redeemed back from God as a reminder of all of this. And the purification of the mother and the presentation of the child, and that could be done conveniently on the same visit to the temple. And during this event, Mary and Joseph run across these two godly individuals, Simeon and Anna. What a wonderful example of a pair of witnesses who are qualified to announce Jesus is the Messiah. Now, this also was in accordance with laws back in Deuteronomy, which said you got to have not one, you had to have at least two witnesses to testify to the accuracy of an event. So, you have Simeon and Anna. They are the first to testify to the Lord. It's like like Luke was reaching as far back as he could into Jesus' earthly life to demonstrate this one, this child. He is the special one, the anointed one, the Messiah. I want us to consider Simeon for a moment. We're told something very significant about him. We're told he is spirit-filled. Told the Holy Spirit came upon him. The Spirit told him he wouldn't see death before he saw the Lord's Christ, right? The indication of Simeon's godliness and closeness to God is seen in the fact that the Holy Spirit directs him to the temple that day. This, by the way, this isn't a coincidence. This is what we call a divine appointment, okay? Uh, It was announced by the Holy Spirit in the quietness of Simeon's heart that Simeon is righteous. What does that mean? It describes his walk with God, okay? He is doing what he was meant to be doing, that he is devout. That describes his walk with men. He is seen as a devout man, and he is waiting for something. You know what that something is? It's called here the consolation of Israel, but Don't let those words slide by you, okay? Think about that for a moment. Uh, This this phrase describes the heartfelt attitude that the faithful Israelites had toward the Messiah. He would bring comfort to his people. Do you recall those passages in Isaiah? Uh, For example, Isaiah 40, which say things like, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Simeon, yeah, he's a model for what it means to wait and to wait faithfully. We all have to wait, right? We don't have any choice about that, but do we wait faithfully? He came to the temple not once or twice a week. He came every single day. Child after child would come to be presented to Simeon, but he was watching for Messiah. Can you put yourself in Simeon's place for a moment? God told him he would see the Messiah before he died. Now he's getting old, and this promise hasn't yet been fulfilled. At what point, I thought to myself um, as I was pondering this, at what point does our faith begin to fail? At what point, for example, does bitterness, disappointment, take over resulting in discouragement, and then loss of our joy. It kept occurring to me this Christmas as I celebrated, I'm like, nothing is going to steal my joy. Nothing. 
I want to suggest something here. Mere religion, you know, going through the motions of faith day in and day out, that's only going to bring disappointment. But you know what a living, a growing, a dynamic relationship with the Lord brings? Long-suffering, okay? Things like joy amidst sadness, creativity, hope. Simon's faith remained strong, and he was ready, ready, when the Lord fulfilled his word. Simon sings a song that, uh, that praises God and addresses Simeon's long wait. And uh, that the blessing that would come to Israel and the Gentiles through the Messiah's birth. He asked the Lord something. He says, now, Lord, let your servant depart in peace. I didn't realize this before I was studying this text. It said, that's a military term used to describe the dismissing of a soldier after his duties finished. Simeon's wait, praise the Lord, was over. He could now die in peace knowing Messiah was born. Now, he was never going to see Jesus, this baby, grow up. He wasn't going to see him baptized in the Jordan River, teaching in the temple, healing the sick, raising the dead. He wouldn't meet his disciples or personally witness his death and resurrection. But then again, think about this. He didn't have to. Simeon knew God's plan was being fulfilled. That was enough. Let me ask you something. Is that enough for us? I mean, I mean it. That's a serious question. Um, Is that enough for us? Could knowing this affect the way that you experience your life day in and day out, the frustrations that are bound to come along with it? We can't stop them, right? They just happen. What I mean is that deeper reality in the end, that everything's going to work out for the faithful. Could knowing this, Understanding it through faith change our effect and our outlook on life on a day-to-day basis because we're at peace. There's another highly important critical detail that goes on in this passage. What Simeon says, his song focuses on the Gentiles. It says he will be what, a light for Gentiles. Now that would have seemed strange to people back then, quite honestly. He was in a Jewish temple. But Simeon knew something beyond what many people knew of his time, that the Messiah would fulfill the promise given to Abraham that was for all nations through which the world would be blessed. So there's a second faithful witness. Her name is Anna. Anna, we're told, and we we know very little about her. She was an Israelite of the tribe of Asher. That was one of the ten lost tribes of Israel. They were scattered during uh, when um, Israel was conquered, one of the many times, by the Assyrians. She was a prop- prophetess, and as such, she was the only, she's the only named prophetess in the New Testament. We're told she was widowed. Now, there was some, I read some accounts that say um, she could have been 84 years old. She might have been as much as 105 and widowed for 84, either way. She was only married seven years. But day and night, where was she? Where did you find uh, Anna? You found her in the temple, fasting and praying. Like Simeon, she was looking for the Messiah. What do these people, these servants of God have in common? They're among the last of the prophets of God, number one. They're among the faithful remnant of Israelites waiting for the Messiah. And Simeon and Anna both have what you would call a prophetic hope. Their faithfulness, as we look at it, we could see it in the first advent, the first coming, encourages us to be ready for the second advent. And who's to say we're not as close to the second advent as Simeon and Anna were to the first one? So, what in summary characterized these two little-known figures in In the Christmas story, I want to make it simple for us today, give you some characteristics. Number one, they were watchful, okay? Watchful. They were looking for godly things to happen. Number two, they were in the right place. They were ministering in the temple. That happened to be the center of faith for the people back then. 
There was a third thing. They're doing the right thing. They remain faithful to the Lord despite everything that's going on around them. They're found faithful. Number four, they're praying with the right attitude, okay? With the right attitude. There's no bitterness or anger or frustration that they're showing with God. And number five, they're looking for the right person, okay? They are looking for Messiah. Now, the comparison, there's, there's something really absolutely profound here. The comparison to Christ's first coming and second coming shouldn't be missed in this story for us. Israel, okay, is expecting their Messiah. They were waiting for deliverance. Today, I believe people are sensing peril. There's a sense, is there not, that something is different. Something is different about the times in which we live. I just got asked in catechism this morning, do I feel like we are in the last days? Well, we very well could be. And just like the Israelites sensed there was something different about the times in which they lived, most people, um, however, when you think about it, have nowhere to turn. They've not taken the time to grow in their faith. This is where I believe. And uh, if you get nothing else out of this, please understand, I believe we have a unique opportunity. What is that? To speak uh, hope and faith and life into today's world, which is largely fearful and anxious. But here's the thing that occurs to me over and over and over again. We're not going to do this if we are fearful and anxious ourselves. How about you? Are you ready for Christ's second advent? You know, what was true way back then is true every bit as much today. The Lord rewards those who look for the coming Messiah. Have you ever noticed something, as I have, as I'm out in the world there, most people aren't looking for the presence of the Messiah? How do I know this, you might say? Who are you to say that? Well, I can just offer this up. I believe looking for the Messiah means that we are looking to see him in everyday life. He moves in us and among us. But there's a catch here. We have to be paying attention. Notice that most of the people are going about their daily life back in the temple when Jesus is brought in. For the most part, it seemed to be an average day. Only Anna and Simeon were ready to see God act. God acts. He does. I truly believe he acts in everyday events of our lives as well. Maybe not as dramatically as to Simeon and Anna holding the Christ child, but in things like our recent caroling event. I want to tell you something about that. I felt the Lord Jesus drawing near in the interaction that we had with the people with whom we sang. I truly, truly did. I felt the closeness of the Lord. He's here. But do we pause long enough to see him? And the great news is, the best is yet to come. I want to offer up a couple of Bible verses. You may want to jot these down. These are so encouraging. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4.8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have, here we go, this is the key, longed for his appearing. Longed for his appearing. There's another one, Hebrews 9, 28. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are, here we go again, waiting for him. Like Simeon and Anna, we must be watchful. This is more than wishful thinking to get out of the trouble of this world. So what does watchfulness require of us? I'm going to leave you with some very simple things to think about. Watchfulness requires, first of all, obedience. What do I mean by that? Laser-like focus on God and what God wants and desires for us. That's obedience. Secondly, watchfulness requires worship. 
What is worship? I would define it down to just one simple word, humility. That is, humility to lift God up, Jesus up, over ourselves. Do we do that? Are we doing it today? Then there's a third thing, service to God. Service to God while you're watching. Serve the Lord in all ways, at home, at work, at school, at your church. Serve him always. And to wind all of this up, I was thinking about that verse that comes to me often. Paul says in Philippians 1.21, For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. What is that saying? Either way, we win. And at present, last I checked with all of you here, we are vertical to the earth. We are above room temperature. Okay, so how about this? How about we agree right now, right here? Our number one choice in the new year, what's it going to be? To live, to make Christ more present in this world. How do we do that? Well, we begin with making a decision about how we choose to wait. Amen, amen. Hello, I'm Pastor Kent Hollis. I hope this message was meaningful to you and touched your heart in some way. We encourage you to check out our website at sjlcmetro.com. That's sjlcmetro.com. You can get further information regarding our ministry here at St. John Lutheran Church. And may the Lord bless you richly as you seek to be in relationship with him.